And otherwise, if we sample proportionally, we might end up with a very large sample for speech and a small one for writing and not be able to describe what's going on in writing as well as we can for speech. On the other hand, if our goal is to understand um, general behavior, or what is the most frequent sense of the word in general, the sense that of a word that a person is most likely to see or, or to use. If this is the case, then it's ideal to have a proportional sample. Um, otherwise, we might overrepresent some senses that only exist in certain types of language. So if we consider a word like like, like like, if we were comparing across speech and writing, we would um, see different functions and meanings in writing as to speech. And, and we would see that in writing, we probably would see um, maybe no instances or very few instances of like as a discourse marker. However, if we're looking at typical usage, the, the type of usage that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we're going to find, we're likely to find that like as a discourse marker is probably its most frequent usage. Um, and so we can see that depending on the method of sampling, we can answer different research questions, we can learn different things about language. So in other words, in short, different goals in analyzing language require different methods of sampling. And historically in corpus research, they have, we have relied on, on stratified sampling because the goal has been to describe language variation um, primarily. Um, and so each, when sampling we try and have strata that are large enough to represent each strata because we want to know what's going on within each variety of language. However, um, there might, we might also sample proportionally in order to describe what's going on in typical language. So each language is represented um, in the corpus proportionally to how much a person sees it. Um, so whereas most research in, in corpus res research has been to focus on the variety, the variance, um, sort of what's going on that's varied across, um, across the strata. We haven't really developed methods for describing central tendency very well, for typicality. Um, and so when I, when I talk about a proportional corpus, what I mean is, well, a corpus is a collection of texts designed to be representative of a variety of language. Um, more specifically, a proportional corpus attempts to describe the language that we typically experience on a regular basis. Um, and it, it samples language proportional to the amount that people experience that type of language. This, corpus is ha this type of corpus has been discussed, has been theorized and talked about, but corpora that are sampled in this manner up to this point have not existed. Um, and, and sort of the reason why is because we don't know, we, or we haven't known the proportions, and, and so we can't design a corpus to be proportional. Um, and so, like Kennedy and, and Hunston have pointed out, um, it's very difficult to know the proportions of what proportion of language in any given day is, is spoken or written. Um, and so, we need to develop methods for designing a proportional corpus because while, they, while this type of corpus has been talked about and even some of the methods hypothetically have been talked about, they haven't actually been refined and put into practice. Um, and you might be saying to yourself, well, it's probably because there is no use for this type of corpus. That's, that's why these type of corpora haven't existed. Well, Right now, con in contemporary corpus research, there are people who are using corpora as if they were typical, as if they did represent typical language experience. So if we look at word frequency lists, which have um, become extremely prolific in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, um, a proportional corpus would be more useful for generating word frequency lists because the goal of most word frequency lists is to help learners see the words that are going to be most useful to them because they're the words that they're going to see the most. Um, well, it's better to use a proportional corpus for this purpose because a proportional corpus is actually going to be more reflective of their typical language um, that in the, of, of the target variety that they want to learn. Likewise, if 
if we're selecting or prioritizing features or text types uh, for teaching and learning, again, um, a prototypical corpus can help us understand what features our learners, uh, what features or what um, text type varieties our learners are most likely to encounter, perhaps in a language for specific purposes uh, setting. So the purpose of my research in this area, again, just to, to recap, is to develop methods for describing this type of language situationally, linguistically, and functionally. Um, the target population um, for my dissertation was university students, um, largely because corporate are often, often being used to represent their typical language experience, even though um, that's not really what they were designed for. Um, our cues, so again, what are the situational characteristics of typical language experience of university students? Um, what are the linguistic and functional characteristics of their language? Um, and then because these methods are, are new, and for some other reasons that, that I'll get to in a minute, um, a major research question for, for my dissertation was, how valid is the data collected from participants? Um, what is the, how can we assess the ecological validity of, of these methods? Um, so to just give you a quick summary of, of what I did in this study, um, I had students at, at NAU keep track of what language they were experiencing over a period of time using logbooks. So every time they were using or encountering language, they noted it in a logbook. Then they used those logbooks at the end of, after they finished collecting data, they used those logbooks to help them fill out surveys, one survey for each logbook entry um, that gave additional information about each time they were using language. Um, I then analyzed that survey data to learn about uh, the proportions of language and that they were using and to describe their language situationally. I then used their responses to, the, to create a corpus, analyze that corpus to describe their language linguistically and functionally. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm just going to talk about the survey study in my talk today. Um, the participants were 53 undergraduate students, um, 18 male, 35 female. That looks a little imbalanced, but actually that's really, really close to the proportions of students at NAU. Um, 38 native English speaking students, 15 non-native English speaking students. I know that the notion of native and non-native is, is problematic, um, but it was useful for this study um, in, in describing these two different groups. Um, and they represented a wider uh, variety of, of majors. Um, they collected on average data for for seven hours um, in exchange for extra credit. So this is what an example of a, a logbook page would look like. They were all given these little logbooks. Um, it has four columns. Uh, the first column is the log ID number, then the time of day that they were using that language, uh, a brief description of the language that they were using so that they could remember what the language was that they were using and the amount of time in minutes. Uh, if it was less than a minute, they could note the number of seconds that they were uh, using that variety of language. The participants were also, to incur uh, were also encouraged to note any large gaps of time where they weren't using language um, to sort of explain, well, when we're not using language, what, it, what is it that we're doing? Um, allowed to use as much space as necessary, weren't restricted to using a single line if, if um, that wasn't sufficient. They could use as much space as they wanted. Um, for each logbook entry, they filled out one survey. Um, it's a lot of surveys, but each survey only took about a minute and a half to complete, so it actually didn't take participants um, that long to, to work their way through all of the surveys that they had to fill out in total, hopefully mitigating survey fatigue. Survey fatigue. Um, the surveys asked, this, asked um, about the situational parameters of each instance of language that was used, including uh, the register of the language that was used. So to get to some of the results of that survey, so if we break it down, if, if we break the results down by mode, whether it was spoken or written, um, I think there were a lot of interesting things to note here. The first one is that Students are interacting more with spoken language than written. This is sort of what we would have expected. 
But what was not expected, at least by me, was how much written language they were actually using. So um, both historically and developmentally, spoken language is, is primary, right? We, we develop spoken language and then written language is sort of an artifact of spoken language. Um, and so it's sort of interesting that this artifact um, of, of spoken language has become almost 40%, 39% of, of, of what we observe the students using. Um, another interesting thing here to note is that non-native English speakers, non-native English speaking students um, were experiencing proportionally less spoken language, uh, more written language than their native English speaking counterparts. I think that this has potential um, implications for, for language learning. Um, if their goal is to be linguistically competitive with their native speaking peers. I'm not saying that it is or that it should be, um, but for some students it is. Um, does using more written language than their native speaking peers, is that a, is that a good thing or, or not? Does that help them with, with fluency or not? Um, I think that that demands a little bit further investigation. As in, and also we need to think about why are they preferring written language more uh, than their native English speaking counterparts. Um, again, native English speakers are using spoken language a lot more than written, but for non-native English speakers, it's, it's fairly balanced, a difference of only about 4%. Um, it, it might be that native English speaking uh, university students have larger um, target language social networks, and that makes it easier to use spoken language, perhaps. Um, perhaps it's just easier for them to use spoken language because of the cognitive demands that spoken language has versus written language. Um, and we see that this might be the case when we, when we look at um, the next slide. Um, but one thing I want to know early on before moving uh, any further is that there's a, just a large amount of variance here. And this is, speaks to just the variability with what people can do and choose to do. Uh, with language at, during any given period of time. Um, there's just a wide range of what people do from day to day or from week to week and from person to person it's highly variable um, and so um, we're going to need in the future larger samples to sort of get more towards the central tendency of what people are, are doing on it um, typically. So if we break the results down by interactiveness, in other words, was there an inter interlocutor there, um, including, this in would include um, technology mediated communication. So text messages or emails would be considered interactive um, versus non-interactive language. Maybe you're just reading a textbook by yourself or something like that. It's sort of strange if we look at these results that non-interactive language has overtaken interactive language. Um, because again, we presume both historically and developmentally that language develops out of, has developed out of a need for interpersonal communication. And so it's therefore interesting that um, non-interactive language um, is more used than interactive language. So there's lots of explanations for why, why this might be. I think that at least it's partly attributable to the, to the ease at which we can access non-interactive language. It's never been easier to go online and listen to a podcast or watch a YouTube video, right, where you don't have an interlocutor or to, or to go online and read a newspaper article. Um, you can do it anytime, any place. Um, and you could also make the argument that, well, you could also use interactive language anytime and any place, but interactive language is more socially, more cognitively demanding. And so I think when given the choice, it seems that university students are preferring to choose non-interactive language. Um, I think that this deserves a little bit more further investigation. It's difficult to say for sure um, why we're seeing those results um, shape up the way they are. Um, I think another interesting result um, from looking at the results by interactiveness was that non-native English speakers are using spoken language less but they're using interactive language more um, than their native English speaking counterparts. And so 
what this indicates is that they're using more written interaction. Um, this allows them to fulfill perhaps social needs or academic needs that they have to interact with peers or interact with professors or interact with just other people, but um, they prefer to do it in written mode, um, presumably because, at least in part, I, I would suppose, because um, it gives them, it offers them more time for planning, for editing, more control over the language um, than sort of the ballistic processing that is required of, of oral interaction. Um, when we break down the results by processing mode, uh, reading, writing, speaking, listening, uh, four skills, depending on how you want to look at this. I think it's sort of interesting if you look at the highlighted box that listening, okay, makes up almost 49%, sort of almost half of the language that these university students were using was listening. Um, I, th I thought that was really interesting. I always supposed that listening was, was the most used, but I didn't presume that it was by, again, these margins. Um, it's sort of interesting from an ESL perspective uh, and an EAP perspective because um, listening is the least taught of the four skills in the United States, at least according to Ling et al. 2014. Um, but other, I think sort of intuitively, we might, we might suppose that listening is the least emphasized in EAP programs. Um, and yet listening is, is quite complex, at least as complex, perhaps more so than the other skills. Um, like speaking, it demands oral automatic online processing um, in real time. But unlike speaking, you don't have as nearly as much control of the rate at which um, language is, is being uh, thrown at you. Whereas with speaking, you, you can control, at least to some extent, the rate at which you're speaking and therefore control the rate at which you, you need to process. Uh, so it's sort of interesting that Based on these results, it seems that listening is the most used, arguably at least as complex as any of the other four skills, um, depending on your definition of complexity or difficulty, um, but it's taught the least, um, which I think um, may perhaps has, has some implications for, for curriculum um, in our EAP programs in the United States. So, I'm going to break the results down by spoken register and then by written register. If we look at spoken register, we see a wide variety of registers here. Um, the register categories are pretty general, um, but yet we see a wide range of things that people are doing with language. This is sort of, of course, what we would expect. We, we would expect that people, that university students are doing a lot of different things with spoken language, um, but this is really the first study that's really tried to quantify how much of these different registers we're using on a day-to-day -day basis, which I think is, is a great finding of this study. Um, one thing that I thought was particularly interesting, if, we're, if you look at the highlight boxes, at, at the highlighted boxes here, um, is that we wouldn't suppose that students are using language very much different. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. If you, um, but in lectures, we wouldn't suppose that students who are native students and non-native students are getting different amounts of, of lectures and sort of that's what's borne out in these results. But when we look at classroom discussions, it seems that native English speaking students are participating in classroom discussions a lot more than their non-native English speaking counter counterparts. And um, I think from a pedagogical perspective, as university professors, we ought to be considering, well, why are non-native English speaking students not participating as much as native English speaking students? And how can we do better in facilitating um, classroom discussion that includes and, and listens to, hears from um, non-native English speaking students? Um, some other things to note, of course, face-to-face -face conversations is, is the most frequently used register here. Um, it was so sort of surprising how much students are listening to music. Um, but I, I just, I thought it was really interesting how many different types of language students are using. And we see that trend continue through written registers of language. Of course, um, even an even longer list, uh, partly because with 
written registers, it's easier to formalize them into formal register categories, whereas with, if we jump back to spoken registers, a lot of stuff fits into face-to-face -face conversations. Difficult to create a taxonomy of face-to-face -face conversations. Um, that's why we're seeing more registers here in, in, in the written mode. Um, but, and just, I think something to note here, if we look at the, the registers that are specifically focused on um, academic language, again, we wouldn't suppose that students who are native or non-native speaking students would be um, required to read different amounts of, of textbooks, and that's sort of what we're seeing being borne out here. Um, but I think when we go over here to homework and um, academic papers that the academic papers is mostly papers that students have to write for class, um, well, pretty much exclusively that, um, we're seeing that students are spending twice as much, non-native English speaking students are spending twice as much time as their native English speaking counterparts. Um, I always knew that my non-native English speaking students required more time on their homework um, or on writing papers for class, but I didn't suppose that it was twice as much time as their native speaking peers, which I think um, gives me a little bit of pause as a, as a professor of thinking about, okay, so perhaps my, my native non-native English speaking students um, are going to need additional assistance or um, might need supplemental materials for completing homework uh, problems for completing um, their writing for classes um, if it's taking them twice as, as long as their native speaking uh, native speaking peers um, I think that that disparity is is sort of probably problematic um, if we look at notes here in the center um, we notice that again we know that Native speaking students and non native speaking students, at least in this sample, were receiving the same amount of lectures, yet we notice that non native English speaking students are taking notes about half as much as their native speaking peers. Uh, perhaps um, we need to be doing a better job of teaching note taking in to, to language learners or helping them. To understand the importance of note taking in the university. Perhaps it's a linguistic difference, perhaps it's a cultural difference. Um, but nevertheless, I don't think it's a good thing that non native speaking students aren't taking as, as many notes as native speaking students. Something that I thought was, was quite surprising, if we look over here at the right in the blue box, um, was I was really expecting written messaging, which is sort of text messaging and, or SMS messaging. Um, and social media to really be a lot higher uh, than what I observed. Um, and sort of upon close examination of, of text messaging behavior and social media behavior, some interesting things arose um, as, as I delved uh, deeper into why, they, why these categories weren't higher. Um, part of it was that the nature of text messaging is was that in, in most cases, students were text messaging, they'd, they'd get a message, they'd look at it, they'd reply, and each instance of text messaging really took a minute or less, almost, almost exclusively a minute or less, um, with rare exception. And so while a student might be sending 100 text messages a day, it might only take them you know, 20 minutes out of, of, of time to, to read and to write those text messages. Um, similarly with, with social media, um, I sort of observed two patterns of behavior. The first, the first was that um, a, a student would receive a notification for uh, social media. They were tagged in something, uh, a friend posted something, they would get on, they would look at it, reply, comment, um, something really quickly, maybe taking a minute or so, um, and then closing their phone, being done with, with looking at social media. Um, or the second behavior was that they would get on social media, they would get on something and, and sort of scroll Instagram and, and scroll for a very long period of time. 
but actually where they're spending the majority of their time was to actually not looking at written language. Um, it was stuff like they would, they would see someone had, a, had an album and they would scroll through the album and spend a lot of time looking at someone's pictures. Or they would see someone posted a video and watch a video for five or 10 minutes. Um, and so actually I didn't really observe very much um, because of those two reasons, we don't really see very much written language um, being, being used or being interacted with by, by university students, at least in this sample that was the case. Um, so I thought that that was quite surprising. My impression was that my students would be using a ton of written social media, um, but that's just not what I found. Um, just to give you a brief overview of the other aspects of, of my dissertation, um, so for the corpus, I gathered, it was just a corpus of their written language. I didn't include their spoken language uh, for, for the sake of practicality, but I gathered all of the written language that they both produced and encountered um, while they were participating in the study. And I converted all of that language to a machine readable format and annotated it with gram grammatical, lexical, grammatical, um, and register information. Um, and analyzed uh, the corpus that resulted from that um, using a technique called multidimensional analysis, which um, is a technique that uses linguistic features and correlations within um, the usage of linguistic features um, to discover underlying dimensions of functional variation uh, using the statistical technique factor analysis. Um, and that helped me with both the linguistic analysis and the interpretation of the functional analysis of why they were using certain linguistic features. Um, I used a whole litany of techniques to evaluate the quality and completeness of, of the methods of, of this dissertation. Uh, like I said, because the sampling method was new, because it relied heavily on students doing a good job um, reporting, being thorough, being detail-oriented. Um, there were lots of threats to the, to the ecological validity of this study. So a great amount of effort was undertaken to uh, evaluate or assess or ensure that, that, this, that the data collected for this study um, was um, able to be trusted. So the participants were tested. After they received training on what they had to do, they were tested. If they didn't pass the test, they had to redo the training. Um, after they completed the study, they filled out a follow-up survey where they were asked questions about aspects of the study that were difficult, types of language that were difficult to gather um, or report on, types of, uh, uh, to make estimates of, of what, uh, how much, of certain types of language they weren't able to collect um, to give confidence of, to report their confidence about how confident they were about certain aspects of, of the reporting process. Um, the, they, a certain number of participants had to download um, an application onto their phones that kept track of how much they were using different apps on their phone. So every time they opened their phone and started actively using an app, um, it kept track of that time and they sent that, that information to me. Um, I observed some participants um, during, throughout the piloting process, I observed some participants to check to see and compare what I observed with what they reported. I observed some non-participant students in several public spaces on campus to see what students who were not participating in the study um, and who perhaps didn't know that they were being observed by a researcher, what they were doing sort of in the wild. Um, I compared from a sampling perspective of, of the students to make sure that I, the student demographics um, were, we understood the biases that existed in that sample. I compared the proportions of, of the sample that I had in my study to the student population at NAU and to the United States student university student population along several demographic factors. Um, all of the texts that, like I said, like I mentioned before, they were 
Sometimes students took pictures of them. Sometimes they were sent me websites. Sometimes they sent me screenshots. And lots of different variety of files were sent to me. And I had to convert these all into machine readable text. So I did spend a, a lot of time checking those texts to make sure that the language was correct, transcribing a, a lot of a lot of um, the language by hand. And I did a, I spent a lot of effort um, going through and checking um, the grammatical annotation, the lexical grammatical annotation, the register coding, and stuff like that. Um, as far as uh, implications, applications for this research, I think that uh, the results of the survey have the potential to inform curriculum design, both for um, EAP or IEP programs, um, but also for universities generally. Um, I think we as professors can learn a lot about um, maybe what are the demands that we're asking of our students and how does that vary depending on the type of student um, based on these survey results. Um, I think it's informative for designing language assessments. Um, often we are but when we're designing a language assessment, we want to understand the target language use domain quite well. And if our goal is to have an assessment where the TLU domain is the university context, I think this type of, these types of results can help us understand sort of the makeup of that domain a little bit more clearly. Um, I think that this method could be used in aiding um, language programs in needs assessments. So if we want students to be using certain types of language more, uh, what do we need to be teaching better, that type of thing. Um, I think a proportional corpus, I, I mentioned this before, it, it opens up the possibility to answer a whole new set of research questions um, that stratified corporate just haven't been able to answer very well. Like how often, in a given day, does a person encounter a particular word or linguistic feature? What is the most frequent or prototypical sense of a word? Things like that. Obviously, there are a lot of limitations. The cross validations found um, lots of weaknesses in the study. Um, some of them were that some types of language were underreported because they're more difficult to, to collect. Um, I wasn't able to collect for the corpus stuff like Snapchat. Students were using Snapchat a lot. It, but because of the nature of Snapchat, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's an app where you send someone a message, but then as soon as they look at it, it's, it's erased from their phone. And so um, they weren't able to really capture that. You could, you could screenshot that, but it's sort of bad Snapchat etiquette to do that. Um, and the other person is notified and you'll be shamed by your friends if you're taking screenshots of people's snaps type of a thing. So I didn't get any Snapchats as part of my research, even though students are using snaps a lot. Um, some language behaviors turned out to be quite complex. Something that, that I discovered through this process is something that we all know about, and that is that people multitask with language. Students are taking notes at the same time as they're listening to lectures. They're listening to music as they're reading their textbooks. They have the radio on while they're having a conversation with a friend. And this type of behavior, while it's something that we're all aware of, um, isn't something that is terribly well documented. Um, so that was sort of an interesting finding, but also sort of a weakness of the study in that I wasn't able to capture that behavior very well, um, just because it's quite difficult to capture. Um, again, small sample size, one university led to a large amount of variance in the sample. Um, and just the nature of, of the task has, both because of, of the observer's paradox, but also because the nature of noting every single time you're using language uh, was difficult. It, all of those factors likely led to reduced accuracy um, in students reporting. Um, in terms of future areas of research, I want to, of course, refine the methods that I use for collecting the sample to, in order to get a, a more systematic and larger sample, both sample at the level of students and sample at the at the level of language it's sort of two levels of sampling here um, i want to look at other populations of course i think really any population we could look at um, these are some that i that i think might be interesting to 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 consider 
Um, I want to see what types of treatments affect the types of language that, that people use and to see what the types of language that people use, how that correlates with language gains um, or a lack thereof for, for language learners. I think we could see this, observe this both with L2 learners and also with L1 learners as well. Um, and that's all I have, so thank you. So let's give Brett a, a hand, at least a visual one, if you will. Thank you, Brett. That's very interesting. And I, so, don't, I don't know how to unshare my screen, so if you can, if you can I, do that, Scott. I'll do that, yeah. Okay, Good. Thanks. We are unshared now. Okay. Okay, so we will open this up to uh, questions and discussion. Um, and feel free to use the chat function as well if you'd like. But if anyone has a question, you can just either raise your hand or I think there might be a, a raise hand function in in here somewhere. I see someone raising their hand. Yeah, sorry, I cannot find the raise hand function, but I have a question if the <laughs> uh, I Thank you, this was great. Uh, I actually have several questions, but I'm just gonna ask. Um, a couple of related ones, but something that you mentioned at the end, which is, I mean, we expect high variance given how your sample was collected, right? But so I was wondering, um, uh, first of all, whether you looked at, say, the baseline proficiency of the non-native speakers, um, and and then if you looked at uh, individual variances and whether you some of the, your features could predict the variance or whether the variance is just noise due to the, you know, the small sample size, right? For example, you, you would expect that maybe a more proficient non-native speaker that is a English major would have uh, you know, patterns of reading and speaking comprehension uh, more similar to a native speaker or not. Um, so I was wondering whether you had the chance to look at those kind of things or no, but I think that would be look interesting to look at. I didn't gather data on the proficiency level of all of my non-native English speaking participants. They were all matriculated students. Um, and so presumably they would have had to have um, attained a, a proficiency score on a TOEFL or something like that, some, some test like that, um, good enough to, to matriculate into the university. But I don't actually know what their specific language proficiency scores or anything like that would be. But I think that, that definitely it would be interesting to, to sort of look at people of different proficiency levels, to look at both what are the linguistic features that they're using and what types of language they're using. Right. So I agree is all I'm going to say. <laughs> Thank you. Lisa, go ahead. It looks like you're muted. It looks like you're muted. There, you hear me now? Okay. Yep. Okay, I may have missed this when you were going over your methodology, but I was wondering if you were having the non-native English speakers also track their language use in their native language, or if you did that with the bilingual speakers. Um, I'm just curious if you had that, so you had an idea of kind of, you know, proportions or something? Yes, I did. Um, and let's see, maybe I have a... I had some, several iterations of this. Uh, I think I have a slide about that, but, but yes, the, 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 more, the answer to that question is yes. So okay. this, this was the uh, overall, their overall language use. So here we can see, oh wait, I didn't, don't have machine screen shared, but let me share this with you really quick. So, can you see this? Yes. So, um, this was their overall, all language, English all, only, and then in my, there's another row that doesn't exist here, but you can just sort of subtract the difference between all language and non-English language to get that, to get to what would be the third row here, which would be language in their native language or in a language that they're learning that's not English. Um, but essentially what, what I found was that 
it was sort of really amazing to me that that even though this was most of most of my participants were native english speakers monolingual native english speakers and even though um this was an english medium university um students are using non-english language um a lot more than i thought that they were going to um and so this isn't an area that i really had time or space to analyze but it's something that i would like to analyze more especially in the age of of the growth of the field of translanguaging, right? Um, it's sort of interesting to see um, that students are using so much language that isn't English, um, even in this, even in this sample. I think um, it isn't something that I that I looked at with very much detail, um, except for noting that they were using how much non-English language they were using, um, but I think it definitely deserves further exploration. And I don't know how to unshare my screen again. I'll let you do that, Scott. For me. I just did that. So we're, okay, thanks. we're back, yeah. Brett, let me ask you a question while others yeah. are formulating their questions. I, I was wondering if you could tell us, um, so I know that you have, you have training in corpus linguistics and corpus analysis, and this study itself involved a corpus. Would you say that this is a typical example of corpus research? I mean, in what ways does it involve typical corpus analysis and, what, and in what ways is it um, breaking ground in new areas? Yeah, so the latter and the back half of, of the study was focusing, focusing on corpus analysis. And from that perspective, the, the nature of the corpus analysis was sort of a very classical, what's called a register analysis, um, which is a very well-used corpus um, analysis um, using multidimensional, using Biber's multidimensional technique. Um, and so from that, all of that is very classically corpus. What was, what was not, what was sort of really atypical was the method of gathering texts. Um, it's typically in a corpus study you have one or two, you have a small set of texts that, that appear in a small set of format that you have a lot of control over. Um, and so, you know, you, you gain the expertise to, to convert one type of, one file type to a machine readable format or to learn a specific transcription technique to convert um, specific types of spoken language into a corpus. But this really demanded that, that I use like every technique that anybody has ever used to convert texts into a corpus um, all in one study. And so in that regard, it was very atypical um, in terms of, of, of assembling the corpus. And of course, um, the design of the corpus being a proportional corpus um, is sort of fundamentally different than, than every other corpus that's been designed. Um, so yeah, that's similar in a lot of ways in terms of the analysis. Um, but in, in the methods in, of, of design, quite different. Thank you. Hi, Mary. Hi. So I have a question. I was just wondering what is the difference between the Fibers 9088 multidimensional analysis and the new factor analysis? And why you opted for the first one? The, a new one. So, so actually, when you're doing an, an, a multidimensional analysis, there's sort of two primary paths you can take, right? You can either perform your own new fresh factor analysis using the text that you have for your corpus, or you can look at the dimensions from a previous multidimensional analysis and map your texts into the factors that another study used. And that's the technique that I used, um, was the, the 88 dimensions have sort of been our sort of tried and true dimensions of general linguistic variation. And so I chose to map 
my texts onto those dimensions. I, I, I wasn't supposing that I was going to find some new dimensions of language variation from this sample. Uh, the goal was to see uh, through the MDA to what extent the, are the registers that students using compared to what we understand about registers, how registers, how typical or atypical um, are those registers? So, for example, the, the first dimension of, of Fiber's 88 dimension is comparing oral and literate um, texts uh, or registers. And what I found was that, um, like for some registers, like there were a handful of letters, they were far more literate than than the letters that appeared in Biber's 88 study, meaning they had features of formal written texts much more than, than oral spoken texts because letters these days are only formal. There are, there's no really, particularly university students aren't writing informal uh, interpersonal letters to each other anymore. Um, and so any letter that, letter that you do write, it's like, I'm writing this letter formally for an application, or I'm writing this letter right for some really formal reason. Uh, it's a letter of intent or something like that. And so um, we see that the nature of some registers is changing over time, or the nature of registers is different depending on the demographic. And that was sort of the finding um, and sort of the reasoning behind why I chose to, to go that route. Does that make sense? Yeah, because as I'm understanding from what you're saying is that your texts were very actually too specific. I mean, they are so literate that you can actually use uh, fibers. Because as you said, it's just the above. Actually, you can see the, the spoken language and the, at the end of the, uh, that line, you can see it's going to be too formal, too literate. Am I right? I mean, um, the the dimensions are scales, and so all all we observed was comparing registers that are the same. Are, how do they how are they similar or different along these different scales? So we found that um, letters these days are much more literate. In other words, they're much more formal. They look a lot more like um, like technical writing than they do like interpersonal communication. So at the end of the scale, so your text, your corpus is just at the end of that scale, right? At the top, we have the oral spoken language at the, at the end of that scale. For example, so, so within the corpus, it's broken down within the corpus according to the text type. So, so we clumped, you can clump together all of the texts from my corpus that were letters or that were emails or that were text messages to see where they fell on these dimensions. Yeah, okay. it's, it's sort of difficult to explain, which is why I chose not to delve into it too much today. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry if, if that wasn't a great explanation. Thanks. Yeah, Mohammed. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the presentation. But so I, if I'm thinking of doing such kind of like a study, but then at a micro level, so I'm looking for phonological sure. aspects of uh, yeah. the language. In this case, how, how the methodology would be different? Like if I'm, for example, like phonology uh, oriented research, I'm looking for the production or the frequency of producing certain type of phonemes and in, in these words or in, in this environment and then not in these other environments. I think yeah, great question. I think exactly the same, except for instead of looking at lexicogrammatical features, which is what I did, you would want to annotate your data set for phonological features. And sort of the set of phonological features is going to be determined by you in terms of what you what are sort of the features that you would want to, that you feel like are interesting for this particular data set that you have. Um, and so everything can be exactly the same except for you use a different feature set. And so the participants will be in this case recording themselves instead of taking Exactly, and then you would have to be transcribing that. Um, either using an automatic transcription software 
or by transcribing by hand, which, which is really time consuming. Yes. Thank you. But would be really interesting. Yeah, that would be a really interesting study. Yeah. So Brett, what's the next step in your research? Ah, good question. First I just need to first I just need to work on on publishing this research, right? No, I think I think the very um my my intention is the next population that I'm going that I'm intending on looking at is um study abroad students. Um okay. and looking at um so looking at language proficiency at the beginning of the study abroad and partway through and at the end and seeing at different stages what types of language they're using and hopefully through that being able to see what types of language lead to what types of language gains um, and sort of the development of features over time as well using the corpus approach hopefully um, by collecting language that they're producing we'll also be able to see um, how their language develops as they're, as throughout the study abroad process. So that's the next study that I intend to do. Great, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? All right, in that case, let's, first of all, let's give Brett a round of applause. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, Brett. That was, uh, it was a great opportunity for, hear, for us to hear about your work, also to see how one of our own students has gone on to be so successful and, uh, and the great uh, research program that you have for yourself.